It's the Power Trip After Party Podcast, presented by Evans Transportation. I tried to open it. And it was that, that, one, that one talks, too. That one, uh, there's like a random conversation between Herb Brooks and Jimmy Carter. From no when, kidding? When they were in the, so we put that in the... Like the Bubble former head, so. president, Jimmy Carter? Yeah, it was when they were going for the 80 Olympics. He's... he's you, He's, you gave it to Zach? Uh, <laughs> who, whoever Welcome to the yeah. uh, uh, Power Trip After Party uh, podcast, brought to you by our friends at Evans Transportation, evanstrans.com. Thank you, Evans, uh, for, for, for supporting this, uh, this stupid podcast. We really appreciate it. And uh, if you're looking for a, a gig uh, or for somebody to help you out with your logistics, check out evanstrans.com. Good people. Uh, are you happy with uh, – can you want to hit the button for me there so people can hear it? Go ahead. No, I mean on the Herb Brooks. And that thing in your hand, there's a button. Wow, that's crazy. So that was Herb Brooks, and that was a bobblehead, talking bobblehead, that the Saints, uh, I, I guess this, when was this released? How long ago was this? That was uh, 2020. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was It was uh, celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Miracle on Ice. Derek, uh, tell everybody who you are and what you do, if you wouldn't mind. Tell everybody your official title. I am the, I am the Executive Vice President and General Manager of the St. Saint Paul Saints, which means I have a corner spot on the tarp when it rains. That's oh. basically... <laughs> That's the, that's know, the best no, spot to be on the exactly, tarp. I mean, absolutely. let's just be honest. You don't want to be in the middle. That's about what it means. And how long have you been with the organization? This will be my 19th season here wow. in St. Paul. Yeah. And uh, with the ownership group, a couple of different ball clubs involved in the ownership group. I started working for them in 1994. And you started so it's been about 30 years. in the pig costume. And I, you've risen all the way to here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, it's, it's nice you wore it now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you look great in that, by the <laughs> way. It's you. very slimming. Thank you. Um, very leathery. Yeah. If, uh, um, so uh, I know it's an odd question to start uh, the podcast with. So what is your degree in? Sports marketing and management. It is. Actually, so yeah. you actually went <laughs> yeah. into that. That fits. No yeah, kidding. Okay, perfectly. great. That's, uh, that's what a, you're doing. That's become a, a, a thing for me uh, because I talked to Abigail, my daughter, about this all the time. She's going to be a sophomore now, and uh, she's trying to pick a major. And I keep telling her, just major in business because it applies to yeah. everything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you never really know what you want to do. But business is, you know, it's like accounting. You can use that in every walk of life. But you actually use your degree every day. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it, it, that's what the, that was the plan. You know, I think I learned more in about a month actually mm-hmm. on the job than I sure. did in four years of studying it in school. But but no question. I've, I have a son who's a freshman in college. Told him the same thing. You know, yeah. business, finance, know, know how the money's made. Hmm. Then you can do anything, wow. right? But yeah. uh, but no, I uh, studied sports marketing and management at uh, Indiana University a really long time ago. Yeah. So you've made the you, you've survived. It sounds like uh, long enough to go through the two major changes with the Saints. You can tell me if there's more than two, but from afar, the two big ones, of course, the move to CHS Field, right? Yeah. Yep. And then the move to uh, being the Twins AAA affiliate, correct? So w- am I missing other significant milestones that you've uh, been a part of? No, no, I think those that, are the big two here in St. Paul. Those are those are definitely the big two. Uh, the Saints began in 1993, uh, re, kind of the restart of independent baseball. Uh, it, it didn't exist at the time. Miles Wolf was a, a sort of a entrepreneur, visionary baseball guy. He owned the Durham Bulls when the Durham Bulls oh, became no the Durham Bulls. Um, he he had this vision for independent baseball. He met uh, he knew Mike Vec, he knew Marv Goldklang, knew Bill Murray, and reached out to those guys to see if they wanted to own a minor league team in, in this new Northern League, this independent league. And uh, they, they jumped at the chance. Um, Mike says, I, you guys have met Mike before. He's yeah. a little bit of a maverick. And, yeah, he's uh, the best. And uh, loved the idea. Um, Murray was all in. And, and Marv Goldklang, uh, another one of our principal owners, is a part owner of the New York Yankees, lifelong baseball guy, corporate lawyer type, but, but passionate about baseball and uh, fell in love with the St. Paul market when they came to visit. Uh, you know, Daryl Strawberry later, Leon Durham later, Kevin Millar later. You go through these these years and and that era of the Saints, and uh, and then the, the life changed for the Saints in 2010 when Target Field opened. Yeah. Uh, that was the first time in the Saints history that we weren't the only outdoor baseball in Minnesota, and it it made the possibility of a new ballpark 
that much more important. So 2015 comes around and CHS Field opens. It's been amazing, uh, an amazing run there. Uh, beautiful ballpark, amazing vibe, fans incredible. And uh, and then this transition here in uh, 2020, heading into 2021, to uh, the, the the partnership with the Twins, which no one in our wildest dreams, the, the Twins nor the Saints, would have ever thought that we would end up here mm. 30 years into the Saints' existence. So yeah. it's it's been awesome. And the shtick that the, the, the Saints had was great. Like, it didn't catch on right away, but whatever. But that phone call, when you all found out that you were going to become a triple-A Major League Baseball affiliate, had to have been game-changing. Yeah, it was amazing. It was, uh, you know, again, it was the the ironic thing about it was a, as the conversations began, I, I don't even know that we thought that that's something that we wanted, let alone dreamt it would happen. You, you know, we were thrilled doing what we were doing. The the independent vibe was in our DNA. Like that's that's who we were. That's who we had been for, at the time, twenty eight years. So, and this was this transition started taking place, and the conversation started taking place during twenty twenty during the COVID season. So we were scrambling, trying to figure out a way to stay in business, right? Like, what can we do? Can we sell, can we sell uh, bobblehead dolls on the internet? Can we open up the concourse for a restaurant? Can we figure out a way to play baseball games? We, we actually moved out to Sioux Falls and played some games over there, um, put, tried to put together a COVID play. So we're going through all of that. Meanwhile, there's conversations to, at the Major League Baseball level w- with MLB and the Twins about this, this changeover that they were going to make and the opportunity for the Saints to become a AAA affiliate. So um, the most important thing for us was, can we continue to be who we are? And the first thing the Twins told us is, we want you to stay who you are. We do not, we want to be involved with the Saints because the Saints are the Saints. And uh, I, Dave St. Peter at one point even said, we feel like there's an opportunity. I think Jim Polad may, may have mentioned this as well. We think there's an opportunity for the Twins to learn as much from the Saints, if not more than the Saints are going to learn from the Twins. So, um they came at it with exactly the approach that we would have wanted to make that move. And, and now it's, it's just such a win-win. I mean, there's, there's no situation like it in all of Major League Baseball. That type of proximity, um, that type of facility, two facilities in the same market, two teams operating successfully in the same market for years, competing in some points. I mean, a lot of times we were competing. So, um, yeah, just, just an absolute win-win-win. Because if they say no about, like, doing the Saint bit, yeah. you have to yeah. change. Because they're the big show, right? Well, we, we, we say no. Yeah. Honestly, we, we wouldn't have made the transition if, if we weren't comfortable um, with the fact that we were going to be able to continue to do what we do. Uh, there's definitely there, – the relationship with the Twins is easy. It's wonderful. Major League Baseball is a little different. Sure. It's, it's been great. They're part of it. Um, but we have, a, we, we have a big brother now. We didn't used to have a big brother, right? It's, we, we never used to have to ask permission to do anything. So now we do have to pay a little bit more attention to, to what we do and how we do it. Occasionally I have to ask for permission or at least apologize. Um, From the Twins or Major League Baseball MLB, or both? More so. More so. The, the Twins are have fun, do what you do. You, you've, you've been doing it for years. We don't want to see a change. MLB, they, 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 they look at things a little bit differently and they, they watch over things a little bit more closely. So, um, But, but it, it's worked. We're, we're a year and a half into it and uh, – Having a blast. Well, I hope the Saints end up being a, a sort of a virus for Major League Baseball, and I'll tell you why. Because I think you've heard me say this on the show enough over the years that I'm just not a big baseball guy, right? Uh, it's, it's my least favorite of the four major sports. But the thing about going to Twins games or going to Saints games, which I did last night with my daughter, and I've heard this about the Minnesota United as well. I don't care about soccer. I like going to Saints games or Twins games because the game itself for me is secondary, right? But sitting out in the sun... You get a bunch of junk food. It's Having super fun. a couple fun. of bad boys. Right. It's, it's the experience more than the game. If you're going to a yeah. Vikings game, Wild game, Wolves game, you're, the game is first. The environment is kind of secondary. Not that those stadiums or arenas aren't good, but you're there for the game uh, experience, I think, is secondary. My daughter had a blast at the Saints game last night. She didn't understand a thing that was happening. Right, and I tried to explain it to her. She didn't care. My point is, long story longer, is – as we see a kind of younger kids struggle with the concept of Major League Baseball yep. and Major League Baseball is struggling to, to ke- like hook this next wave of kids, just being fans of the sport of baseball, I hope maybe at some point there's a culture shift where they realize what you guys have been doing for a long time is maybe the way, maybe not to watch it on TV, but to get them to the stadium, yeah. right? It's 
Let's not take ourselves too seriously. This is a super old game that some people really, really like, but if the younger generation is not super into it, let's have them come to the park and have a blast so they'll at least come back and have fun. Make it more about the uh, the actual on the uh, on the day in stadium experience. So I hope it works backwards for uh, for Major League Baseball, and maybe you guys can be a part of that. Well, we hope so. You, you said it off the air. It's it's a vibe, right? Like wa- yep. walking into that building, it, it's a vibe, and the fans own the vibe. I mean, we do our best to nurture it and 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 help to create that vibe, but but they own it and they have a blast with it. And and our fans have been doing it now for thirty years. Um, they. they we were fortunate that they followed us from Midway Stadium over to CHS Field, and CHS Field has created new fans. But it's interesting what, what if you follow any of the news about what's happening at the Major League Baseball level and how they're test driving different rules at the minor league level. I don't know if you noticed the the pitch clock. I saw that. Yeah, I saw, four, I saw fourteen that, yeah. seconds. I think it, it looked it, like there are different levels of it. it, it there, I think it's thirty seconds when when it's switching to a new batter. It's it's twenty seconds between pitches. It's a different situation when it's a foul ball. Um, but but it's the, the idea is to to shorten games and, and primarily it's the, to shorten games at the major league level, but they're doing the they're applying the rule at the minor league level so players get used to it by the time they get up to the major leagues. I'm all for picking up the pace of the game. There's no there's no reason not to work on making sure the the pace of the game picks up. But but honestly, you guys have been to games. People aren't thinking about whether they've been there two and a half hours or three hours. They really aren't, and not at our ball. If if we're doing our jobs, they're thrilled to be there for three hours, three three hours, three and a half hours, whatever. More know. time for beer. Yeah. <laughs> well, amen for that. It's a party. So so we always feel like it's it's not so much about game time and shortening the game. That's such a focus of of Major League Baseball. It's not a focus of ours. Obviously, we're going to do what we can to help them accomplish what they want to at the Major League level with the rule. We're going to do our best with that, but but we want to make sure that folks are having fun for as long as they want to be there. And if, if we're doing our jobs, they're not, they're not worried about the time. If you're sitting at home in October and you're watching a, a Red Sox-Yankees game and it's four hours and 20 minutes. Preposterous. That's insane, yep. and that's mm-hmm. got to get fixed. Yep. But at the minor league level, people are having a good time. The guy last night for Rochester, because that was, the, I think, the first time I noticed the 14-second pitch clock. I hadn't noticed it the first inning and a half or so. It was almost reversed. I'm so used to 90 seconds in between pitches at Major League Baseball. That dude was throwing a pitch before it had about 10 seconds left on the clock. So by the time he got the ball, it was about four seconds, and it was so unnatural. I'm like, dude, slow down. Yeah. yeah. Like, you are right. You got 10 more seconds left. He almost had gone so far the other way. I'm like, this guy's going to throw his arm out. So, like you said, maybe the players are slowly getting used to it. That guy clearly is like, I got to lock this thing and load it. it. Yeah. yeah. Four or five seconds, and it was back over the freaking uh, plate again. That was kind of crazy. I was not used to that. It does. It, it does get rid of the 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 Nomar Garcia par, the guy that oh, would step man. out of the box. And oh yeah, work everything. You know, it does yeah. it does solve that problem? Um, so so again, pace of game is great. I, yeah. I get that, but but trying to shorten the experience, we'd rather not do that. Well, let's, let's talk about that experience because I was thinking yesterday at the game how we went from the Metrodome. And Midway Stadium to two of the oh, finest God. ballparks in the in the world, and and CHS Field we're we're spoiled. It's a, it's a beautiful facility. It's one of those places you would recommend visitors who are coming to the Twin Cities to check out. But I remember those Midway Stadium days, and and it had a charm. It, it had its purpose, it but it was it was tough in in certain areas too. Um, did did Midway Stadium kind of force? It really helped the Saints in a way, though, because it really it seemed like it forced you guys to be creative because you didn't have a lot of the to- tools, the toys, the the yeah. scoreboards, et cetera. You guys, it was just it was the stadium, and that was it. <laughs> you had to make it up. It was yeah. So a lot. Some of this was before my time. Like I w- I was in Fort Myers for seven years, then I was in Charleston, South Carolina. So those first eleven years of the Saints, I'd always call the guys that were there the dream team that that really created the the vibe that we were talking about. You're 100 percent right. Like the building was just a concrete block with metal bleachers and porta potties, railroad tracks. Mm-hmm. You know, the railroad tracks were the things that that's the thing that everybody remembered about Midway Stadium. So they they actually went the opposite direction and and figured out ways to sort of poke fun at at the things that you found in the big flashy stadium. So instead of a big jumbotron over the left field wall, 
they literally put a 13-inch TV over the right field wall. <laughs> brilliant. And they said, let's turn our attention to the Minitron in right field and watch the replay. <laughs> That's brilliant. Or, or Mike's, Mike's famous night of uh, MimoVision when he, when he put the mimes up on the dugout to do instant replays. <laughs> and <laughs> not, genius. Not realizing that people hate mimes, and it turned into an absolute food fight. People started throwing hot dogs at the awesome. mimes. And, you know, 27,000 hot dogs later, and um, it's, it's the best concession night in history. So similar to the, the, the old Metrodome had the, the tire race sponsored by whatever auto parts company. So that's where I think it was Donaldson that did the. Uh, yeah, Ryan he fell Johnson. last night <laughs> at the tire race. So that's a carryover, right? We, we've got the video board now. Um, mm-hmm. we, we could do a tire race graphically on the video board, mm-hmm. but it's way more fun to actually have real life people rolling real life tires. So yeah, it's and all of that came out of of how would how do we do this in this ballpark and how do we have poke a little bit of fun at, at the uh, at the biggest. It's also being a minor league team in a major league market. I mean, now you got a couple of minor league teams in this market. But uh, at the time, we were the only minor league team trying to trying to sort of find our way in the shadow of Major League Baseball, the NFL, um, NBA. So, light ourselves on fire. Derek, as we go to break here, real quick, um, settle a bet. How do you say your last name? Sharer. See, what Told- did Zach say? No, I, I've I've heard I've actually had to ask you that three yeah, times or so, right. and I knew I had it right now. So anyway, so there you go, <laughs> Derek Sharer. Is our uh, our guest? He is uh, basically runs the Saints. Is that fair to say? It's, that's good enough for say. you. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, so, then you should be fired because somebody let Zach Halverson throw the first yeah, pitch last still, night. And we'll talk about people. that and oh, much, much more. Yeah. And uh, as we uh, take a break, we'll say thank you to our friends at Evans Transportation. And again, thank you, Evans Trans. Uh, uh, Derek, uh, back into what you were just talking about a moment ago. The thing that that I go back to with Midway Stadium uh, is twofold. Number one, uh, TD Mischke broadcasting live. Um, and I'm, I don't know if that was in your time or before, before. my time, but okay. I know all about it. Man, I loved it. I used to, it was before I was back in radio and I was driving around, I had a pro, do you guys remember Pro X, the, the, uh, film developing place Pro X? Yeah. Anyway, oh, it, yeah. yeah. So there was a, a film developing and my job was to drive around in the evening and pick up the film and deliver the film to the, to the shops. Anyway, I would listen to TD Mischke and it was just great radio and it was weird radio, but you could hear the. The love of old school baseball in his voice, and he never talked about the game. He wasn't allowed to do the play-by-play, right? But you could hear the baseball game going on behind him. And every now and again, he'd be like, "Oh, hold on one second. There's a home run ball headed this way." It's brilliant, man. And that was one of the things that I loved about the Saints before I'd ever been to Midway Stadium. So it's been it's it, what a journey to build what you guys have built. And I think it's an interesting line you guys have to walk now, as you've talked about a couple of times to make sure you retain the joy of the St. Paul Saints while also moving into this new generation of the St. Paul Saints. It's huge. And, and you, you asked me if, if, in essence, I run the Saints. I, the answer by title is yes. I work with and for some of the most talented, incredible people in the world. We have an amazing staff there that, that just, they just bust their rear ends, work in ridiculous hours and creativity through the roof. And, um, and, and it's those people that have taken on the responsibility of delivering that. Like when, when we made the move from Midway to CHS Field, it was it was a promise we had to make. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't. You would think it's a no brainer. Every team wants a new ballpark. You know, that's the, in the sports business world. That's all you ever hear about is is new facilities being built, football, hockey, baseball, whatever it is, basketball. But our our crowd, our fans, earlier in our history voted against a new ballpark. Norm, Norm Coleman, as mayor of, of St. Paul, offered the Saints an opportunity to move down to where the XL Energy site is, is, the center is built right wow. now. Said, let's build a ballpark because the Saints were drawing 6,000 people a game at Old Midway Stadium and let's move it downtown and, and start working on, on sort of that, that building that vibe in downtown. And it was pre, pre high, it was post North Stars, pre Wild. They had this great site and uh, Mike Vec. Man of the people puts it out to the fan base and a resounding no. I mean, it was they, they campaigned. They built a Save, Mid, Save Midway website. Um, and I want to say this is probably late 90s, 1998-ish. And uh, so fast forward, uh, you know, four, five, six years, and, and Mike 100% regretted ever asking the question. <laughs> yeah. you know, don't ask the question that you don't want the answer to. Yeah. And, uh, and we, we began the process of, of – working toward a new ballpark. We had no idea it was going to take until 2015. 
But uh, it was really important to do it the right way and to and to bring everybody along with us and to make sure that our our longtime fans, sort of that, like I said, that the the the, the keepers of the vibe, um, to to make sure that they were coming along with us and and were were comfortable. Let's go back. You just used the word creativity. That's probably the word that gets thrown around uh, to the Saints maybe the most. Is that you guys just come up with super cool ideas? I'm sure there's a thousand that you that never saw the light of day that you could tell us stories about that would blow our minds, right? But uh, walk us through like a creative meeting at the Saints, how ideas get thrown out, how preposterous they have to be to just get immediately shot down. Because if all ideas are good ideas, right? Yeah. How crazy does it have to be where you guys know immediately that's just never going to be able to get pulled off? It, well, you always hear the stories, and they're true, pizza, beer, conference table, no idea is a bad idea. Those, those meetings happen. Um, several times a year where, where you, you sit down with the goal of coming up. I'm sure you guys do it too with the show. You, you sit down with the goal of coming up with ideas. The, the best ideas don't ever come from those meetings. The, the best ideas just come from a conversation, from a phone call. Our, our office, if you ever have a chance to walk through the office, it's kind of an open space. Same way at Midway Stadium. It was, I mean, we were in the bowels of, of Midway Stadium anyway, so we didn't even really have offices. So the best ideas just happen somebody hung up the phone talking to a potential customer trying to sell tickets and said, Hey, this guy just said something about whatever, or, or something was in the news that morning. And Hey, we should try this. Those are the best ideas that just sort of start a conversation. And by the time the idea has actually happened and and come to fruition, you don't even remember who came up with the original idea. The best example I can come up with is, uh, man, I forget what year this was. Um, 2008, maybe 2009, but uh, Larry Craig, the senator from, yep. you know, mm-hmm. he, yeah, that was he, the uh, airport toe tapper yeah, guy. Yeah. yeah. So, so we, an intern walks into the office one day and says, man, can we do anything with that? And we're all like, ah, <laughs> you know, it's a, I, we need it. We need an angle. You know, we can't really just, there's, you're not going to do Larry Craig bobblehead night. That doesn't feel right. Um, so some guy comes back and pulls out the, pulls out the, whoops, ex- yeah. pulls out the, alm- the, the, Chase Almanac, and says, hey, this is uh, May 25th, is National Tap Dance Day. Oh my. Like, okay, all right, well, okay, let's keep talking now. So mm-hmm. you start brainstorming a little bit from there, and um, it's, it's, it's all about having an idea that has some layers to it. So it's, uh, we, we decided we'd celebrate National Tap Dance Day. Instead of a bobblehead, it was a, a bobble foot <laughs> in, a, in a porta potty, uh, in a right. bathroom stall. Jeez. And uh, we, we never, I, you know, in this, in this, on the air here, I said Larry Craig, but during the promotion, we never, ever said the guy's name. It was National Tap Dance Day, giving away the uh, bobble foot. And the next thing you know, we have CNN with a truck sitting in the parking lot interviewing people in line for the, for the giveaway. So th- those, are the best, genius. Th- those are the best ideas, the ones that just sort of happened from a conversation. Sure. So, all right. So the one, the bobblehead that you uh, handed me before the podcast started this uh, Darwin Day, June thirtieth, two thousand and ten. Yeah. Can't we right? all get along? Yeah. So it's it's Darwin, and it's you know again Australopithecus or whatever, right? So it's and I said, who did this piss off? And you said basically everybody. Yeah. Uh, how many Saints ideas do you think uh, that ends up being the goal? Where you you understand this is going to piss off a section of our. Fan base, maybe season ticket holders or whatever. Yeah. But ultimately, we have to keep eyes on our product. And if it gets CNN here, if it gets headlines, it's worth the risk of, of making some people mad. How often do you have to do the risk versus reward scale with uh, promotions? Ho- hopefully fairly often. You know, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, ideally, you can come up with a fun promotion that gets a bunch of attention without necessarily pissing somebody off. But it's sort of in our, I mentioned DNA earlier, it's sort of in our DNA to, to, to push the envelope a little bit. Um, again, that was one where you're, you're, it was creationism versus evolution. So you got both sides that are mm-hmm. equally, and, and, it, and th- that would be the goal. If, if you're going to do something edgy, l- let's try to piss off both sides equally. Let's not take a side. Um, the, the, the Larry Craig thing, we, we had folks calling us saying that, that we, were, we were celebrating a lifestyle that they didn't believe in. So we had that group that was frustrated. And then we had other folks that were saying, you're making fun of our lifestyle. Like, all right, well, at least we equally pissed off both sides. But, yeah. but there's, you know, you try to find that happy medium between promotions that are edgy and, and are going to be, that are going to challenge things a little bit. But then also you want to do stuff like a, a ballpark-wide food fight celebrating yeah. Animal House um, that doesn't piss off anybody except for the guy that, you know, 
That's maybe came up. to the game without thinking. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. It has yeah, to clean it up. There's that too. Correct. There's that too. Which, by the way, in minor league baseball, is everybody in the front office. I um, bet. So, so yeah, you definitely try to. You, you want to do some things that toe the line. Um, if you're going to upset somebody, uh, another good example was uh, we, we did a, a promotion uh, that, that we called. We changed our name to the Mister Paul Aints, and we, we just took all of the. Uh, we had a we had a group of there was a, there's a group called the Minnesota Atheists. They came to us and so they shockingly I'm not a part of that. Although I probably should be. <laughs> but you led. Can that you give group. me their website, please, Derek? They they they, uh, they wanted to bring a group of folks out to a game, and and one of their guys stopped in the office and he said, "All right, I know you're never going to do this, but how fun would it be to just take all of the religion out of the Saints' name? I mean, your name is the Saints, like I so." We thought about it a little bit and uh, had a couple of conversations with them and decided we'd have a little fun with it. So changed the name for one game to, to Mr. Paul Aints, the, pulled the S off the uniform, took the S off of everywhere in the ballpark. And um, that, that's one. So, so the unintended, uh, the unintended uh, result of that was instead of CNN, we ended up on Fox News. Oh. Um, they, 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 they were suggesting. They were pissed. That, yeah, they were suggesting that people should not go to that ballpark on that night. What? Before. Can you believe it? Can't believe it. Can you believe it? So, so yeah, again, ultimately, we'd like to do promotions that are just fun, make people smile, yeah. laugh, and have a good time. Occasionally, you want to toe the line a little That's bit. That's awesome. Um, this is way too much of a blanket statement, but you'll get the spirit of what I'm saying. Um, are you guys record-proof when it comes to your crowd? Does it matter if Wins you're a good losses. or a bad team? Great question. I, I was uh, I was trying to th- – yeah, yeah. It's funny. Uh I think we're a little bit less record proof now than we okay. were before yeah. as an independent because people didn't know the players as an independent right. team. Yeah. They, they, you know, our, our hardcore 400, 500 season ticket holders that are there every night, they knew Brent Shoemaker and, and they knew um, Vinny DeFazio and they knew the guys that were on our rosters. Um, but the rest of the fans were just coming out. I and mean, we actually did a, an ad campaign one year where Mike Ve- where Mike stood at the front gate and interviewed people on their way out and asked them if they knew the score, and he like <laughs> and asked them if they knew who who won who was who we were playing, <laughs> and, and, and just had a, <laughs> and had a no no That's so many so people good. didn't. Yeah. Um, we we did a campaign one year called "We Won't Break Your Heart." It just kind of having a little fun with the the, the Minnesota sports community that mm-hmm. unfortunately gets its heart broken a lot. We're like, look, we, we won't break your heart, and it wasn't because we were going to win every game. It was because you don't really care. <laughs> so, so, so I think we're we're a little bit less. We're probably a little bit less record proof now because I think people do. We're, we're getting more a mixture of more hardcore baseball fans that want to come out and see the absolute top prospects. I, I think for the most part, people still want to come out. And it's funny fun. though because last night, yeah. right, eight runs in the first inning, and that was. A problem for me because I kept telling my eight-year-old, no, hang on, the tire race is not that far along. Like, there's going to be some bits. And then the Saints kept putting up runs, and they had, like, one out. And I'm like, this <laughs> half inning's taking forever. The kid just wants to see a she race. To yeah. see a so promotion. it was almost like the Saints' success was buzz-killing her yeah. fun, right? She <laughs> wanted to get back to whatever was going to happen during the half inning, which is the other thing I was going to say about uh, about the Saints uh, last night is, man, there's no, there's no the half inning ends – and everybody just sits and waits for the next half inning of baseball. You guys always have something going on. So it's almost like um, there is no boring intermission, right? There's something to watch. There's something to do. There's a bit. There's a contest. Uh, there's not a lot of downtime. So it's it's you guys are putting on a three-hour show. Yeah, it's, it's Sierra Bailey is our, our – what, what's the new title? Uh, Vice President of, of Brand Experience and Marketing. Um, promotions director is like at her, at her core, what, what she is. And, uh, she, she's running all over that place nonstop with a, with an army of, of game day promotional interns. And, uh, the, the fun thing though, is, is she's at the, the point of it. She's the one that's making that, that every half inning happen. Um, but, but everybody on the staff from the groundskeeper to the ops director, to the concessions director sits in on those conversations and comes up with ideas. But uh, yeah, we do our sensory overload, right? We do our best to, to keep it busy and and uh, and keep it fun and and never. It, you don't ever want to hear that that baseball is a boring sport. You know, you mentioned you're not a baseball fan, probably because it's not the same kind of action that you get out of watching a basketball game or sure. another. So so that's 
if and and Mike could tell you this too, if if we counted on baseball fans back in 1993 to to build our business, we wouldn't have lasted. Right. Yeah. We, we had to get other. We had to get people who didn't care about the game to come to games. Is there any other story like the Saints that can go from independent where nobody knew any of the players' names, the score, the opponent, to now being a triple A, being a step lower? I mean, without last year, Byron Buxton was playing. It was amazing. Out in center field. I mean, th- is there any other story like that in the baseball world? Yeah, only because of this this sort of reboot that Major League Baseball did with Minor League Baseball. They actually brought three independent teams over. Okay. Um, so, so a couple years ago, Major League Baseball owners get together, and this is – I wasn't in the meeting, so I'm giving you my version of it. <laughs> but basically they're saying they're, we, we need to change some things. We need to – our minor league system needs to be better organized. It needs to make more sense geographically. Um, we need to have more oversight on the facilities to make sure that our players who we're trying to develop – are in good ballparks, living in good apartments. And so they wanted to figure out a way to go about that. And where it landed was this complete reboot. They went from having six levels of minor league baseball to four. So 43 communities, actually, this is a bummer, uh, but, but 43 communities actually lost their affiliated minor league baseball team. Major league baseball came back in and helped those communities get a different version of baseball, independent or college wood bat or whatever. But, that reboot, as part of that reboot, there were there was our situation with the Twins. Um, Houston has a had an independent minor league team down the road from them, Sugarland. Um, so they said we'd like to have them be our AAA affiliate. And, and the Skeeters, the Sugarland Skeeters, yeah, you got like it. They're, Roger they're now Clemens the, connection to that. Yeah, or something? he, he played for him. His son played for him. Um, they're now the Sugarland Space Cowboys. Made a made a brand change. Hmm. I think like Skeeter's better, maybe, but whatever. Skeeter's, Skeeter's is, fun. is great. Skeeter's yeah. is kind of funny. Space Cowboys fits the Houston dynamic, but sure. uh, and then Somerset Patriots are outside of uh, New York, so they became a Yankees AA mm-hmm. affiliate. So, the, but for that, I don't think you would have ever seen an independent team make the shift to affiliated. But that that this sort of cataclysmic changeover in in uh, Major League Baseball and Minor League Baseball. Yeah, because that was like a big thing for a while. Like triple A, double A. Like, I mean, they're playing baseball for a living, but like a lot of them weren't being treated like humans. Like it was like almost like a minor league baseball version of the fire festival where they were like <laughs> living in like tents or like just yeah. bad situations. Yep. And these players and the the owners were like, we pay these guys. We need these. These are our, you know, our interns. Basically, we need them in better situations. So it was obviously the right move. Yeah, there, there were there were situations where where minor league teams had players sleeping on cots in clubhouses. Um, it, it, yeah, just it it needed more oversight, and and they there was a heavy focus on the health and wellness of the players on their sort of minor league journey, and uh, they've done a good job with it. And we're glad to be a part of it. If you start working for the St. Paul Saints, is the uh, the film semi-pro required viewing? Do all of you kind of try to channel Jackie Moon? And I guess what I'm asking is, is anybody willing to wrestle a bear at CHS Field? I'm in. I'm in. No, I, I will. Uh, I will pass on wrestling. Do you love that? I'm movie. sure we could find somebody. Do who you would love that movie? Zach? It's a great. Movie. You almost have to, right? I mean, it's a great. Again, the whole, a great the whole idea that like a handful of teams are going to make the NBA and the rest of them aren't, so they have to actually win yeah. instead of just wrestling bears. Uh, what a great bit, man! A- absolutely, Flint Tropics. Have you absolutely. had a Flint Tropics night? We have at CHS so we Field. Do we a just, semi-pro night. If we can get if we can get Will Ferrell in yeah. or, or awesome. Josh uh, Bratton, Brayton, Bratton, yeah, Bratton, yeah, Bratton. he's in. He's in. Have yeah. uh, Bill Murray has to know Will Ferrell. Yeah, have Bill probably call a connection Will. there. Right. Have him out. There's probably. A Do you have there. Bill Murray's phone number in your phone right now? Because he is a he's historically right. He doesn't give his number or does you know he doesn't have an agent right. That's right. So it's hard he's, to get a hold of him. Number. You have yeah. to know him. He's got the eight hundred number. You know him. I, I do. I do know him. I, I. I actually participated in an event that nearly killed him. Go on. Um, Go very on. early on in my career. Uh, this was uh, nineteen ninety six in Fort Myers, Florida. I was twenty six years old. I had just been named assistant general manager. So I'm thinking, mm-hmm. I'm skyrocketing. It, it's all happening. Yep. I, my, I took my sports marketing and management degree, and I'm rolling now. Bill Murray, Mike Vex down there. It's during spring training. It's during the twin spring training. And uh, we, we, we operated the building for spring training. And then we ran the minor, we owned the minor league team down there, the Fort Myers Miracle at the time. Um, so I was the assistant GM of the Miracle. We, we helped run the building for spring training. Bill was coming into town with his two oldest sons, uh, Luke and Homer. Uh, Luke, by the way, is now an assistant coach for UConn. 
basketball. Wow. The, the only other job I think I'd want than the one I have would yeah. be to, to coach college basketball team. Wow. Um, so Luke and Homer coming in, they're like, I don't know, they're like 10 and 13 or something at this time. And they come rolling in, and, and, and literally Murray used to travel around in a, in a what do you have? What, what do you call your vehicle? My Mustang. Oh, the Dragon Wagon. The, the Dragon Wagon. So yeah. he, he had a Chuck Wagon. <laughs> right. he, had a, he called it the Chuck Wagon. It was, it was a, a RV, and he comes rolling in in the Chuck Wagon, and, uh, and this is going to be my first opportunity to meet Bill Murray. And he looks exactly like you'd expect, like purple T-shirt, plaid shorts, black socks, whatever, tennis shoes. And I walk up, Mr. Murray, it's very nice to meet you. I'm your new assistant general manager. My name's Derek Scherer. Um, let me know if I can do anything for you. And he's like, yeah, uh, Mr. Assistant General Manager, my boys have been on the, on the road for hours. Could you, you mind taking them to the batting cage? Okay, well, that's not exactly what I thought I was going to be doing. As, <laughs> sure. Everything, as assist- it's all happening, right, though, right? right. It's no, all you're happening. babysitting. No, it's right. all happening. Okay, yeah. okay, so batting cage. We'll batting, sure, we'll batting cage. And so I take the boys down to the batting cage. Um, first, we stop by the Twins Clubhouse. Homer could care less about sports. Luke loves sports. So he's at, this was, so the Twins, I don't know if you guys remember the Twins in 96. This was not like a, this was not a great era of Twins baseball. It was like Matt Walbeck, Pat Mears, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Roberto Jeff Kelly. Yeah, yeah, this was not the period of time. So, but, but, but Luke Murray knew all these guys. He's like, okay, man, do I want to be, uh, do I want to be Roberto Kelly? Do I want to be Matt Walbeck? So he grabs those two helmets, takes them down. We go to the cage. It's the two, they, these guns, the guns have two wheels on them and you, the dial goes like zero to ten. So you can see where this is headed. Oh. So I got kids, so I, I got young boys here, so we're, we prop the gun up so it's going to lob it in. I turn the machine down to about four, and it's just it's barely getting to the plate. And Luke is having a blast, and he's, got, he's switching helmets. Now I'm Roberto Kelly. Now I'm, now I'm Matt Walbeck taking swings. Bill comes down. He's leaning on the cage watching, and uh, Homer could care less. He's just kind of wandering around. And, and Luke says, Dad, jump in here and hit. And he's like, all right, I'll get in. I'll get in. And he gets in. He's like, okay, Dad, do you want to be Matt Walbeck or do you want to be Roberto, Roberto Kelly? He's like, I, I don't care. The ball's barely making it to the plate. I don't need a helmet. <laughs> Come on, Dad, wear a helmet. Who do you want to be? All right, it'll be Roberto Kelly. So Roberto Kelly has a pretty small head. Bill Murray, <laughs> the opposite. Meets us. So, yeah. <laughs> so the helmet's just kind of sitting – you kind of like Max's hat right now. <laughs> that's kind of how, that's kind yeah, of how yeah. the helmet's sitting on yeah. uh, Bill's head. And I'm now I'm now halfway between home plate and and the gun. And Homer's behind the gun. Luke's up talking to his dad, and his dad's standing there just kind of swinging the bat, getting ready to hit. And I out of my left ear, I just hear the machine start humming louder and louder and louder and louder and louder. And I hear Homer say, "Hey, Dad, get out of the way. I want to see how fast this thing throws." But Bill oh, couldn't hear it. No. I could hear it. And the rest is like slow motion. I see Homer's hand take the ball, drop it in the machine, and it's propped up. And he's got him, the dial's turned up to 10. Whoa. Ball fires out, and it squares Bill oh, wow. right in the forehead. Oh, so right God. in the Twins logo. Helmet flies up. Bat flies up. Bill Murray flies up. Lands on the ground. My career flies somewhere <laughs> up here, off into the distance. Wow. I'm assuming, and yeah, I, you know, he's down on the ground, and I'm thinking, "Holy shit! I just, I just killed, killed Bill, Murray. Bill Murray." So, Homer shoots down the hallway. He's gone. <laughs> Homer's gone. Luke, Luke, and I are leaning over, leaning over Bill Murray, and uh, you know, it's it's it, this. As the story goes on, it's like he he was out for five minutes. It was probably five seconds, but you know, he's laying there, and I'm leaning over, and Mr. Murray, Mr. Murray, are you okay? And I, I swear to God, the first words out of his mouth were, I'm fine. I, I don't think I should take any more swings, though. <laughs> you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't have the heart to tell him yeah. that, that he hadn't, hadn't yeah. swung taken off. a swing yet. Oh so I'll wrap God. the story up quickly. We're sitting in the office later on. He's got an ice pack on his forehead. Um, Homer is, is that, like, I'm trying to decide if, uh, you know, does, does Bill think, that, does yeah. he think I was behind the gun? Does he know that it was Homer? Does so? But I, just, I take the high road. I'm not going to – it happened. I was involved. I'll leave it at that. We're sitting in the office, Mike, Bill, Homer, Luke, myself. And uh, Luke, awesome kid, says, Dad, aren't you glad I made you be Roberto Kelly now? And he says, yes, Luke. And that's why you I love and Homer I do not. <laughs> <laughs> so at that, moment, like, at that moment, I'm like, okay, yeah. I made it. 
So, so the, the full circle question is, what would the Saints have done to celebrate or promote Bill Murray's <laughs> tragic death? <laughs> Half helmet night. Yeah, would it be, exactly, would yeah, it be like amazing. Bill amazing. Murray headstone night at, uh, at Midway Stadium? Dented helmet night. Yeah. Yeah. Dented helmet, helmet night, exactly. Yeah, so everybody's Dented wearing a night. Sunday Ice helmet. pack night. This, this, think about that, though. This was 1996. Think of what, uh, like, what yeah. culture and what art we could have missed. Yeah. Thank God he put that helmet on. Right? Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Dude, right. that's a great way to end it. And let's have you do this again because we didn't even talk about other events at the sta- you know, at the stadium and what you guys have in the future and everything like that. But it's been a lot of fun. And we're looking forward to coming down on June 29th and having Power Trip Day. At, you know, it's uh, Power Trip Day off. Uh, you can find tickets, obviously, at, at stpaulsaints.com and at kfan.com as well. And we're going to do a lot of uh, fun things and special things. But let's expand this relationship. Let's have some fun together. Let's do it. Thank let's you very it. much. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Absolutely. Thanks, yeah, that was great.